Good morning, everyone. Hopefully you can hear me all right because I can hear, I can barely hear myself. Uh, first time for me on a silent stage, so please bear with me. Uh, my name is Ricardo Galbiati. I'm the chief uh, security officer for the JPEG region at Palo Alto Networks. I didn't have to travel far to come to AWS Summit like probably most of you because I'm based here in Sydney. Uh, and today I want to talk to you about a word, a new word that you might or might not have heard of. It's called platformization and especially how that applies to making cloud more secure and scalable at the same time. But let's take a, a little step back first. If we were to ask ourselves, what would making our life easier mean in cybersecurity? We could have uh, multiple answers. As every simple question comes normally, the answer is it depends. And so if we took a more tactical, let's say short-term view approach to answering the question, we could say, well, how about making our life easier by getting faster and more accurate responses when making decisions around cybersecurity. Good way to make our life easier. But maybe we would focus more on reducing stress and, stress and friction uh, around our staff and engineers, or even using AI, as we all know, the word that we cannot avoid mentioning, in helping us achieve more with less, helping our people to deliver more. Well, these are very good points in simplifying our lives, but if we elevated the conversation at a more strategic level, we would probably answer it slightly differently. For example, we could say we want to align better our cybersecurity goals to our business goals so that we can see the value of each. Or maybe focusing on lowering our total cost of ownership and uh, provide better justification for the spend in cybersecurity so that we can justify the budgets that we assign. Or maybe focusing on better procurement. How do we navigate the number of procurement processes to make them simpler and easier to adopt new security technologies? Um, great answers, all valuable, all possible, but all of them pointing to the fact that there are a lot of optimizations required currently in cybersecurity, and these optimizations take time. And time that we don't really have to spare when we are facing attackers that, as we have clocked them, our Uni42 incident response team has been able to demonstrate that some attackers can infiltrate, exfiltrate, and encrypt all within 14 hours, a window of 14 hours to do the entire campaign of the attack. And our defenses on the other side, unfortunately, are only probably dealing with this after two or three days. So how are we able to compete with attackers that are faster and faster when our life is still so complicated? And that is the reason, in fact, for the imbalance. The imbalance on why we are so slow compared to how attackers are hitting us is complexity. Now, this is not today's news. We have heard about complexity being the first enemy of cybersecurity for probably over 20 years, 25 years. Bruce Schneier wrote articles and blogs about this in 1999. And he recognized that the more we adopted technology and capabilities that we're making our life easier, securing them was not coming that easy at all. We were actually complicating our lives. If we fast forward to 2024, well, we have run at Palo Alto Networks a survey called What's Next in Cyber? And we have asked about 1,300 organizations around the world to give us their trends and expectations for what the cybersecurity market looks like. And one of the most consistent data points that we extracted from that was that organizations now run, on average, 32-point products to secure their entire estate. And that means 32 different consoles to work on, 32 different training streams to get your people through, 32 different data locations where all these tools are going to store their information, and also 32 different procurement processes. So that doesn't scream simplification to me. It makes it actually very different towards our desires or having our life easier. And speaking of desires, one that definitely transpired from the survey itself was that 77% of the organizations that we interviewed recognized that reducing point products would be the first place they would want to make a change. Because by reducing the number of tools that they're operating, they would get better security maturity, better procurement process, less friction, easier ways to manage the technology stack, and also eventually also get advantages on the licensing and cost side of things. So I would say that the consolidation direction is a fact in the industry. Everyone is looking at reducing and doing more with less, having less disparate solutions, but 
although we recognize that consolidation is required, the question is how? How do we consolidate? What strategy do we put in place? Is there such a thing as a strategy? And that's where platformization comes in, finally. So platformization is that particular strategy that can answer the question on how should I consolidate? And if we go for a proper definition, I could say that platformization is that structured architectural approach that is aiming at simplifying security, making our life easier, but specifically approaching it in key domains. We can't have a one platform fits all kind of approach and provide better security efficacy, better decision making, and also better business value as opposed to going with disparate approaches. I would go insofar in saying that if we are not doing platformization, if we are not trying to platformize our business when it comes to cybersecurity, we are going to fail in consolidating. Now, the word might be new. Maybe we made it up. I think our CEO made it up. There's a bit of a joke around the industry that that word doesn't exist. But the approach itself does work. And we have been, well, we haven't necessarily, but it has been demonstrated uh, in the industry and in other verticals of uh, the IT industry as a successful approach. For example, think about the 90s when we had a different word processor to our different spreadsheet manager to a different uh, slideware product. And then platforms came to be. And now there are only two or three choices that you really go out and pick when you're trying to adopt those capabilities. You wouldn't go out and buy a word processor individually and a completely different um, software for the other functions. Similarly, in the CRM space in the 2000s and beyond, companies like Salesforce have been able to centralize the approach to multiple best of breed capabilities aimed at improving customer journeys. So they are now holding almost 50% of the market share because platforms do work when they are implemented correctly. So with 77% of organizations expressing interest in consolidation, then it only makes sense that we start going about that platformization wave in cybersecurity as well. So what is Palo Alto Networks doing now that we've figured out what platformization means? What is Palo Alto Networks doing in this domain? And I'll soon get to the cloud space because we are at AWS Summit after all. First of all, we have identified the three key domains of cybersecurity where platformization makes sense. And you see them displayed here. In yellow, we have the network security space. In blue, we have the cloud security space. And in green, we have the security operation space. Now, the yellow one is probably the one that most of you, if you know Palo Alto Networks, are familiar with because 15 years ago, we launched our very first platform, which was the next generation firewall. And you can see the number of capabilities that we have embedded uh, as part of that platform and are able to deliver as best of breed capabilities within the platform itself. Now, from the firewall, we evolved into the virtualized version of firewalls, providing them as a service in our SASE um, approach. And more recently, in joint uh, partnership with AWS, we also deliver these as a cloud NGFW, which is provisioned directly within the AWS marketplace. So here you go, a uh, first platform of choice where we are consolidating capabilities. Now, the problem of fragmentation in the network, which is what we were experiencing on that side of things, started manifesting itself with cloud adoption. The more we adopted cloud, the more we had new functionality, new features in cloud, the more a new product was created for the purpose of solving them. And so we realized we need to platformize that area as well. So we built a specific platform that consolidates those capabilities in one. And finally, security operations, which is a growing area of our business where fragmentation is, again, happening very fastly, very fast. Uh, the problem with security operation is that we have been relying on tools like the SIEM, security uh, event management systems, that effectively have required a lot of manual work from analysts in the SOC that have to then pivot into multiple consoles at the same time, and we don't believe that is going to drive down our speed of action whenever we are under attack. So we are, again, consolidating into platform on that side of things. By the way, I'll do an early call out. All these capabilities are going to be on display at our booth, so please feel free and, and come and ask those questions when the session is finished. Um, now, it's all good and well to say we're built platforms, they work great. But then we need to measure their effect, efficacy. And when people adopt platforms, they tend to feel that they are compromising somehow, right? So I get a platform, it will be easier for me to use. 
but I will get less than effective capabilities. And we don't believe that that should be the case. So we had our platforms effectively tested and proved by uh, multiple third party uh, analysts, and they still stack up and they are still in the leader squadrons of all these individual capabilities they provide, even when compared to companies and vendors, they only focus on that single point product. And more importantly, what does it mean once you adopt these type of platforms? What is the outcome of consolidation, as I, as I was saying before? If platformization is the how to consolidation, what does it look like? Well, on average, you can see that we're able to consolidate and integrate between four and seven vendors, existing vendors in each one of the security domains that I've just identified. Now, it doesn't mean that we want to replace every vendor, but there is very much of room to optimize the consumption of these capabilities. And one great proof of this is the consoles, the unified consoles that we have built for each one of these domains. You can see now, in the network security space, we have been finally able, as of this year, to consolidate the view of all network traffic coming from any user, any source, to any destination, regardless if it's been enforced via physical firewall, virtual firewall, cloud, NGFW in AWS, or our SASE offering into a single dashboard. That is quite revolutionary, and it proves that the front end is delivering on the platformization promises. Similarly, in the cloud security, you see a centralized console where all your cloud estate can be analyzed and viewed. And in the security operation side of things, flowing of all alerts into a single place where we can lead with automation and AI effectively to move at real-time speed when addressing incidents in our environment. Now, as I said, this is the very high level of a view of what platformization means, but I would like now to deep dive a little bit more into the cloud space, and especially how do we use platformization to better scale and secure AWS environments. So let's start with a bit of a stats uh, shootout between the opportunity and the risk the cloud provides. Most of you know this already, but even Garner is demonstrating that by 2026, public cloud will be the platform of choice for any deployment. So we are going to definitely move towards a cloud-first approach. And uh, the speed of delivery nowadays has reached a weekly recurrence. So 77% of organizations are now able to do weekly delivery of software using public cloud. And they're also helped by the fact that generative AI is speeding things up. It's a force multiplier for developers. These are all great innovations. But on the other side of the coin, we have the risks. And I'm sure that all of you are dealing with open source code a lot and how much of that is vulnerable. And if you think about it, every code and every software is at a certain point in time vulnerable. We're just using it so fast that we need to keep up with making sure that we correct it in time. And how long is that time? Well, 15 minutes is the estimate between an exploit being available in the wild and someone tried to exploit it into the cloud. So that is your time to detect and how low you need to shrink your efficacy in order to prevent that from happening. The ratio of developers compared to the ratio of security people is still highly skewed on the first side, which means we produce a lot, and then we have to chase all the issues that we have. And unfortunately, yes, Gen AI helps making faster applications or building applications faster, I should say, but they're also introducing a lot of uh, possibly vulnerable code. Templates that gener generative AI uses not always are the most secure, and they're going to end up in our environments. So with all means, that being said, why is cloud security so difficult? So why is cloud so difficult to secure? Well, because we have now changed the approach on how we build applications, and we have effectively three main phases: the code phase, the build phase, and the runtime phases. And each one of those throw at us multiple challenges that we historically have been used to solve with individual approaches in silos. We've been focusing on fixing things at infrastructure as code and things in workload protection and things at identity level, all in isolation from each other. And by doing that, we've been also adopting point products to try and tackle the issues. And so we have actually increased, as we were talking about statistics before, the number of point products that we have to manage and made our life more complicated, more complex. We could also say that we have lost a bit of the sight of what we're trying to do with cybersecurity in the cloud. We're focusing on individual, let's say, very tactical components, while we don't realize that what we're really trying to secure is the application itself, not so much the subcomponents that are part of it. 
So it is critical that we change our mindset when approaching cloud security and focus on an application-centric view. And that's how we believe cloud security can be solved. Yes, an application is made by the past, the platform as a service, the compute, the infrastructure, the APIs, the storage, the identities, and beyond. But it's more than the sum of its parts. And only when we see that all in a single place, we can start making sense of how well we are tracking with our security approach. So what does that mean in practice? Well, an application, if we're trying to secure it all, it's not just the runtime. It's not once it's been built. It's where did the code come from? Which pipeline has pushed that code through into a workload? Where did the images get assembled? Whose identities of the developers are currently embedded in my application development lifecycle? So we need to see that as a whole, as a continuum from code to cloud, and that is what we have called our platform effectively. And so having visibility across the entire application lifecycle enables us to deliver still those point functions, but in a platform and contextual way. And so this is what the code to cloud platform the blue one that I explained about before operates. It focuses on visibility from code to cloud. It's able to offer remediation of issues from code to cloud, and I'll show you what that means in a second. It has application-centric view of the entire cloud estate, and it also leverages AI, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second as well. But more importantly, is able because we now have contextual visibility to measure how well you're tracking, reporting, is finally possible from developers to operations to security teams. That interface that I was showcasing before, this is the latest version that is going to be released very soon. And it's finally a place where we can have developers, operations, and security meet to discuss how well they are targeting the security for their applications, not just for the subparts and components that are uh, building, they are, they are uh, composing the application itself. And that's where the AI element comes in. What a better way there is to chase for issues instead of going around the interface by clicking buttons and generating queries by asking the tool to answer a question. And in some cases, even has the tool to fix the issues for you. That is how AI should be used. So if we complement a good centralized interface with AI help, then we're going to get down to those 15 minutes or less of remediation. A couple more screenshots in there about the interface, as, you, as I said. Application-centric, what does that mean? Well, we have built a capability that we call AppDNA that focuses effectively, effectively on identifying applications that are delivered to the business based on their business criticality, on their ownership. And then from there, we can break down into the various subcomponents, which are the ones that are possibly generating issues or that we need to focus on. But once we combine that in that particular view, we now have a better perception of how is our application secured? And what elements can we improve within it to improve that security level? You see how the code to cloud element comes in. Or similarly, how many times we have heard of a misconfiguration in our cloud estate that opens up ports that we shouldn't have left open, but do we know what the impact of that could look like? Can we trace back the path of an attacker to an actual instance that could be exposed? In some cases, these misconfigurations lead to nothing. In some others, they lead to your crown jewels. So having the visibility, again, from code to cloud and drawing for you the entire attack path of how an attacker could get in and where it would go, it's so important. And it also allows you to make a decision if I should fix that issue right there at that moment in time at runtime, a temporary fix, I say, or go back to the original code or the template or the configuration that was created that created the vulnerability itself and fix it forever in code. Again, this is only possible if you have built a platform from code to cloud. On the other side of things, if we know that there is a vulnerability out there in the wild, how quickly can we chase it within our environment? Well, if we have visibility from code to cloud, we know that this number of packages contain that vulnerability, this number of images have been deployed or built with those packages, and this number of workloads and services are running with that. So we can now have a full picture of where the issue has been created, how it's transited through, through, through production, and how we can fix it at any given stage. Code to cloud. And as I was saying, importantly, reporting, reporting, reporting. If we don't know how well we're improving, we're lost. And so this type of approach allows you to measure burn down of issues, improvement of posture across each one of the three development stages. The build, the code, and the runtime at the same time. Now, with that, I...
give you a good um, overview of what platformization looks like. I focused on to the platformization for the cloud, but I think there is no better way to talk about this with someone who has gone through the process, who has gone through a journey of moving from point products to uh, platform approaches. So I'm so excited to invite on stage um, PEXA, the Property Exchange Australia, who is a great partner of Palo Alto Networks and AWS, and they've exactly gone through this particular journey. And so to tell you more about it, I'd like to pass uh, the microphone to Anish Dharmakan, who is the Cloud Security Lead at PEXA. Thank you, Anish. Um, thanks for that, Ricardo. Uh, I'm Anish, Cloud Security Lead for PEXA. Um, I thought I'd walk you through to two different timelines. Um, 2021, where um, we were faced with Log4j, we did not have the full suite of Cl Prisma Cloud in place at that stage. And by 2024, quite recently with the exit, we had a full net integration that Ricardo was mentioning earlier. So in 2021, uh, we had a lot of tools, a lot of uh, home-built ones and third-party and other software vendors that we use to scan our systems. So when things like Log4j popped up, we had to react pretty quickly and decisively. Um, so what we did was we looked at what the footprint of this CV is. So we, we thought we'll start with the workloads because that's where it's running. So you want to actually go straight in to apply your mitigation. So once we were done with the WAF, we started scoping out where the CVE was located. So we had a mechanism to scan our containers, uh, which was kind of tied into Prisma at that time, so it was easy to scan it, get the list out, rinse and repeat the process for Lambdas. We had a homebrew solution, so we kicked that off, got the result into the spreadsheet, and repeat the same with EC2s. So we did the same, we had to collect a big list, uh, and once that was done, put it together and move on to the next stage of it, which is the CI CD, where your code becomes reality in, uh, that runs in your workload. So we updated a sensor there just to tell us if the CV comes across. So once that was done, we reached to the hardest part, which was code. Um, at the time, the code scan was done by a different software system and a different security system, so it was hard to pin down which code uh, map to which compute. You could, we had many repositories, like hundreds of repositories. Some of them did not link to an actual workload, like I would, I assume most of us do, but some had many workloads running. So there's a little bit of a prioritization that we had to kick in after we got the list. So we took the code dump, scanned it all, got the list out, uh, sifted through and started the patching work. Well, all this was happening, the crown jewels were already getting patched, but it took a bit of effort. It took, I'd say, somewhere around 12 hours before we mapped everything out and then uh, kept updating it. So now 2024, when exit happened, all we had to do was um, just punch in the CVE. So there's a query up there, so you investigate, find CVE, and that maps out where um, Prisma sees it. So Prisma can scan containers uh, on demand. So if a container gets refreshed, it, get, it automatically scans it. Uh, same thing with EC2s and Lambdas get scanned as well. So as a result, we don't have to kick off any additional scans. We just have to query for the CVE and it kind of tells you where it's located in your uh, workloads. So, and coming to CI CD pipelines, um, Prisma's got a bot that we employ. Um, so based on the policies that we set, so if there's highs and criticals in the code base and in the artifact that gets built, do not push it to production. So it automatically flags it. So, but if you're a paranoid like me, you can set an alert there saying, if you see the CV, just send me a Slack message or email. So you get an additional visibility. And the last part, which was the hardest the first time around, became the easiest now, because that gray line between code to workload was pretty obvious, and it just lit up. So we knew which code repos we needed to focus on. So we could raise a pull request from the console into that. Uh, but there is another feature hidden behind it, because we hooked up our repositories to Prisma Cloud. The pull request directly appears on your code repository, so when a developer is working, he would see a suggestion by that Prisma bot leaving a comment saying, hey, would you like to update the version of this React to overcome the high CVE that it spotted? So developers are not losing context, don't have to come into this console to see. They kind of fix the issue in their own workbench. So it's like a huge time saver, so we're not spending a lot of time triaging the issues. We know where it is, we go straight to the defense. Um, speaking of defense, we 
taken a layered approach in cloud. So we use a mix of both Prisma and Amazon security services to secure our platform. Um, and we, we test each layer separately to see its effectiveness routinely as well. So our first layer is Amazon WAF. Um, it's a very effective service. In its efficiency, our effectiveness is rather dictated by the rules that you use. One of, one of my favorite ones there is the Amazon Managed IP Reputation List. So this will, um, Amazon has their own thread intel and they have a list of uh, malicious actors and their IPs, so they automatically get blocked if you have this rule set in place. Now there's another rule called AWS Bad Inputs. This is also one of my favorites because it helps prevent zero day attacks. So if you look uh, deep in the configuration, uh, try to use this rule. For attacks like log4j, this tends to catch it. So, but what if you miss it? So you have a WAF, but you do not have bad inputs. Now you're kind of open to your zero day attack vectors coming in, Prisma Cloud, reads your WAF configuration and alerts you, hey, you've got an API, but you haven't applied the rule in AWS WAF that protects you against zero days. So it's two security systems talking to each other, making sure we have the best security configuration with it, so it's, it's really good. And uh, moving down, we've got a bit of compute protection going on as well. So we use two or three systems for this. Um, the primary one being Prisma has a defender which draws a baseline of your compute. So if it always queries, if your compute, all it does is upload to an S3 bucket that forms the baseline. On an odd day, if it starts doing random database calls, that gets flagged as an anomaly. Guard Duty operates in a similar fashion, which we, are, we also use um, in, for threat detection. And we don't want Guard Duty findings to be ignored. Um, and Prisma does not. So what happens is, if an alert is raised by Guard Duty, Prisma reads into that, adds context to it, so for example, if Guard Duty sees a C2 domain query, Prisma will add uh, additional information to it, so it checks the network layout. It's in a public subnet, which would push it higher on the risk priority. It would add context to it by checking the floor logs if it's actually seen any traffic. So by collecting more information on the alert raised, you can prioritize the risk, and based on where it lives in your network layout, it also prioritizes the risk, which is a massive help, which means the alert fatigue is gone, uh, and we can focus on the riskiest part of the system that we need to tend to immediately. And the last layer is the network firewall. We worked on this last year. Um, so I think around um, 2020, Amazon launched a feature called the Gateway Load Balancer. So this, what it did was it enabled, security teams loved it because we could now run our security appliances and all you had to do was update your VPC routing table to point to the appliance and it will uh, check the packet and send it back to you. Which meant we could now ask Palo, hey, can we use your firewall as a service? We don't have to host it, they manage it, and we know that threat protection is built into it uh, fully. So we integrated it straight away and we've got, again, a zero day protection happening there at the lowest layer as well. So every layer we're able to mitigate threat and they can operate in isolation and together they work well with both solutions. Thanks for that, I'll give it back to Ricardo. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Anish, what a great story of and platformization and thank you for the partnership and, uh, with us in AWS as well. So in conclusion, I'd say, you've understood now what platformization is all about. You know that consolidation is coming and is required. So if you want to understand more about it now and see it for yourself, please come to our booth and have a look at the various consolidated approaches that we're taking in the three domains that I described. And next week, maybe start thinking about what that could mean for you. How many point products are you actually running today into each one of the domains? Most likely the cloud one is the most topical for you at the moment. Uh, and how could that look like? We can navigate you through together. So feel free to reach out to myself, to the team over uh, at Palo Alto Networks to go through the journey of consolidation and platformization together. Thank you very much for your attention.